ladies, and welcome back to another Get Right with Miss Right. I am so excited. Before you, we have our panelists today, and our topic is called limits and boundaries. Like, how do we set that, right? We are living in um, different times, right? And we're seeing a lot of different things that are happening in our society and things that we probably were used to and you know helping our kids to be resilient back in the day is it's a little bit slightly different now and so um we just want to encourage you today and empower you with some tools and some strategies we have um miss liz hall which is one of our bradley parents i'm so proud of her we have bailey smiley the support coach and then we also have joe Rowland, which is an assistant principal at bosman intermediate and so we are all going to go ahead and get started and let's just get into it with further ado because I know parents are thirsty for knowledge and insight as well as some of our educators out here. So how you can help your families become more resilient. Um, so our last talk show, we talked about like help. My child just won't listen. Right. And it's it, it's a struggle sometimes because when I hear um, some of our parents say, well, my kid doesn't act like this at home. Um and my, it seems like my kid is only acting like this at school. Like, what am I supposed to do? And I want to let you guys know that that is a common thing that I hear. Um, and I really feel that sometimes it has to just deal with per different personalities, different expectations. I mean, we are just coming kind of out of a little bit, kind of still in the midst of a pandemic. So there's been a lot of loss. There's been a lot of transitions. There's been a lot of changes. So as you, you know, start to hear these things today, right? I just want to let you know that, you know, you're not alone. So Miss Hall, can you tell us a little bit about your insight of just um, have your girls kind of struggled with that school settings um, and home setting, just being able to balance both of them? Um, it was a little bit of a challenge, um, just kind of getting used to a stricter schedule, mm -hmm. you know, getting up at a specific time, mm -hmm. you know, school starts at eight o'clock. Um, but I think just the consistency of doing it day in and day out has, it's become a little bit easier. Um, but it definitely was, you know, a struggle, I think, not only for the children, but for parents as well, you know, getting back into the routine of, of daily life. Um, and it took definitely quite some time to get there. I love how you talk about routine because as we know, like the school setting has like a specific type of structure, uh, a specific times of, you know, order and the way that things are done. And so sometimes I would say, and Bailey, I would want you to chime in. And then Joe, it doesn't always have to do with, well, you know, if I don't do this within my home, then that makes me a bad parent because I am not structured in this way that the way that the school is running. So Bailey, can you, you know, speak to some of maybe the different things that you've heard from, you know, some teachers or some, some even students themselves just having to try to find that balance, like what's right or how can I adjust or um, how can I be more supportive because they are different. My advice is coming from me as a teacher and as a parent myself. So um, as far as structure goes, I think back to my days at working from home with my kids and I am absolutely 100%, you know, structured as a teacher, but as a parent, it looked a little different at home for me. I'm the one who started with the uh, written out schedule. We had a checklist where we would check the things off as we completed them. And after week one, I wasn't able to maintain that at home. So. I mean, give yourself some grace, but what I'm noticing at school, as far as, you know, students coming in and readjusting to structures, I think that they yearn for it at school because we, we are interacting with so many people and so many, like you said, personality types that we have to have some comfort in, in working within a structure that's defined and consistent so that we can give ourselves grace and learn how to interact with people who aren't our people at home. You know, it's different at home. We, we know who each other are. We know our limits and our boundaries and our pet peeves. And we know when we want to push the buttons and when we definitely don't want to push the buttons. But at school, we don't spend the same amount of time together. So it, it takes some time to learn that. And if we give ourselves some structures, then that just guarantees everybody's success up front. 
So there are some, th some things that you can take from school and implement at home, but keep in mind too that it's not a, a copy version. It's mm -hmm. not a carbon copy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's things you have to, first of all, you know, the first thing is, is at school, teacher personality and teaching style plays a huge role yes, in is. the types of structures we implement. And teacher advocacy and, and autonomy is a huge part of that as an instructional coach. That's number one. Um, because every single person in the school building is a human first, and we all have to feel comfortable, safe, but then, um, you know, comfortable to work within the environment that we're given. And structure is number one, but it's also flexible. Thank you, Bailey. What about you, Joe? So uh, she hit on a really strong point um, about the structure. And I always look at it as having worked at uh, high need campuses where it may be 99% economically disadvantaged or um, just a really uh, diverse, uh, diverse urban background in my past before coming to Conroe. And the biggest thing I learned was structures equal safe. Uh, sometimes the only consistency students see as far as a safe environment is at school. I know that, you know, food is served at this time. Uh, this times I know the rules of this and that I will get in trouble or others will get in trouble if the rules are, are this and that. I think sometimes too we forget because we had an opportunity to be home. Some parents did not. And uh, whereas um, older siblings were uh, necessarily watching or, or creating their own norms within, within the home. And so even at the five, six level, what we're noticing is there are a lot of kids that have absolutely have academic gaps, but they also have peer-to-peer um, -peer interaction gaps where they really struggle with how to interact with each other and they're in the sixth grade with a third grade mindset on how to interact with each other and so we, we found that um, I know personally having talked fourth and sixth grade that's the the fourth third and fourth grade swing is when they really start to solidify understanding how they impact other people uh, and, and becoming really socially aware and so we're so noticing that some kids just don't have social awareness of their actions and how it impacts others. But, uh, you know, we're working to help fill those needs, fill those, fill those gaps with those students with providing a safe environment. You can't teach until a child knows they're safe. Um, you know, safe environment, a safe, uh, strong structures that, that embrace that first, because first the structure, then you can add academic needs and rigor. Awesome. Well stated. And I liked how, Joe, you talked about safe and you talked about structures, which kind of leads us into our next thing, um, Bailey, as she, you know, works and really helps to coach, you know, our teachers and just really understanding um, student behavior and, and helping with their own personalities on to have great interventions. Um, let's talk about like just different parenting styles because it's like there's those teaching styles but i i like to say that there are those parenting styles right and and i think that takes a lot of you know reflection on your personality on how um how you feel as a parent and what you really allow your parents to do and i would say that there is you know the permissive parent really that allows their kids to do just most things um uh, not probably just really bothered by it. Then we have the authoritarian parent, which we probably have some of those back in the day. It's just like, you know, my way or the highway, and this is the way that it needs to be, and you better do it, and that's it. And then we have the most beautiful style that I love, um, the authoritative parent. And so I really want to take some time on that because I think that with, you know, parenting and finding that balance, um, that all of you are, you know, talking about today is that give and take and maintaining that relationship and really helping, you know, our kids to understand that we, you know, we want the best for them. We want them to be safe and what that looks like. So Bailey, if you can tell us like, you know, with being authoritative, like how do you kind of know sometimes with, you know, that giving and taking when, or, you know, your opinion on, when it's a little bit too much or too blessed, or how do you even create that kind of structure in your household? Because <laughs> that's a lot. Well, you know, I'm thinking of a parallel to the classroom real quick, and I'll circle back to my own parenting style. Yes. It differs depending on my emotional status. Say. I'm going to be honest. Um, but in the classroom, you know, something that we teach very often is first you have to have a really good awareness of what your own need for a level of structure is. 
And so, you know, we, we even have teachers go through and do a survey where they understand what it is that they personally need stepping into their own environment because they're the creators and the facilitators of that. And if they don't understand that, then of course they can't facilitate well for the level of structures the students need, which then of course often varies. Um, but there's a low level of structure, which is just what you said, that real loosey goosey kind of anything goes, you know, kind of hippie like. Uh, love is all kind of yeah. level of structure where, you know, I can work with anything and anybody and there can be, you know, loud noises around me and I'm okay with that, right? Um, then you have a very high level of structure, which is, those are maybe that second parenting style that you referred to, which is, I need to have all my dots, I's dotted and all my keys crossed. I have to have my schedule. I'm going to stick to it every day. I know seating arrangements. I know who's going to sit next to who. I have a a chart of how many times I'm interacting with students and I know every procedure is posted on the wall. You know, everything's defined. There's no wiggle room whatsoever, but everything is, it, it's there. No question, clarity is number one, right? And then you have that mid medium level of structure, which is, which is a blend, it's, it's both of those. Um, there's flexibility, but then with the clarity of a high level of structure as well. So what we found is that in the classroom though, that high level of structure is what really facilitates that safety that Joe was talking about for most learners. So you would think that that middle of the road would be the best place in the classroom, but what happens is, is for those students who really do need that high level of structure, they're left out of that. So the higher of structure you go in the classroom, the more people you can get that feel safe within that environment because the people who thrive with a low level of structure can also thrive with a high level of structure. Um, I don't necessarily think that that carbon copies, like I was saying, go to the home because, you know, whenever you're at home, the relationship is number one mm -hmm. and there's a lot of unsaid in that relationship. There's the expectation that we're all living life and we just got to live life together. I mean, that's how it is in my home. So I'm the parent who is that middle of the road parent, but I'm also a person personally who really needs a high level of structure. I noticed that in my kids. My kids don't necessarily always need that. And you have to keep in mind too that in a lot of homes, you might be partnering with another adult, which would be dad or mom, right? Mm -hmm. Who might have a different style than you. And the way that it doesn't carbon copy into the home is because there's not just one person running the show, there's two people running that show sometimes, right? And so you have to be able to create an environment where everybody is able to, to kind of create their own safe space and take some risks as well. So. I don't think I would want to operate in a home where my mom, which I did, where my mom tells me every single move to make every step of the way, because really what that does is it doesn't leave any room for the kids to um, figure out, to make mistakes and learn from them, right? Um, but that does work for some people because that is definitely what some kids need. So it, it just varies. But what we were saying was level of structure. I think if I was going to, um, give one piece of insight that you can take from school and kind of use in the home is just be good at being self-aware. What is it that you need? Uh -huh. And then what is it that your littles need? And you know that right off the bat. I like to say they are who they are from the start. We just have to pay attention to them. Um, so, you know, you also have to, I, in your last episode, one of you said that you have to give respect to get respect. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And respect doesn't come from the words that we just say. It comes from our action every day. And that is definitely true at home. And, you know, it's all about connecting before you correct. So that connection happens within the safe environment that you facilitate in your home or even at school. But it's just about being self-aware and aware of what's needed um, on a daily basis because that changes. So, Joe, I know that you will have to leave a little bit and then we'll move to, to Liz. Um can you tell us, you know, how do you balance as a father? Like you're this educator, but then you're a dad too. And so how are you, you know, finding yourself um, moving between kind of like Bailey said, like I'm kind of in the middle, you know, um, tapping into some different styles. Like how do you balance that, right? Right. So um, she's two. Grace is my daughter. I have her right here. She's two. So, um... <laughs> You know, she's two, she can't, I can't necessarily engage her like I do uh, the fifth graders and stuff from there. However, I do talk uh, to her directly. I don't, I, I, you know, I don't know, I guess for me, 
I just because I, I feel like man, she is once she's very aware, uh, she has very good observations and she's and she's very intuitive and uh, she's really intelligent um, already. And I, I noticed that you know from the jump. So I think it all like you said already depends on your style. And my styles tend to match. I'm actually a little more uh, I would say rigorous with my daughter. Um, just because I want, I, like you said, I want to create strong structures for her. Um, now I still, you know, I play with her, but it's like within a set time of play. Um, you know, um, it'll be okay. I get her ready for bed. You know, she has a hair, she that hair. Uh, she has like a hair routine, so I get all the stuff in her hair. I attempt to put it in a ponytail and all that, and so then I, I try to really isolate and give her okay, give her do that enough time to give her 30, 45 minutes of my undivided attention. Um, because a lot of times with engaging work, I'm at work from sometimes 6.45 to 6 or, you know, depending due, due to our schedule. And so when engaging students at school, I really work, live in the reflection, like help them try to reflect on their actions to make better choices. And a lot of times when I'm engaging their parents, not more likely than not, I probably already gave them another chance. Or unless it's just like an egregious activity that like they straight up, you know, stop the kid or, or something like that. And a lot of times I'll try to work things between us while still notifying their parents of the incident or they say, hey, we are, um, we talked about it. I'm going to keep giving them a blank, uh, a clean slate, you know, to start. I don't necessarily connect every every interaction I observe. You know, if it's a, a pattern that we're seeing, that's something that, that we can address and then I move forward. But the number one thing, too, is when that kid is successful in making those changes, I praise that kid. Uh. Just like with teachers. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm coaching a teacher and I see that like uh, they're meeting expectations, I go out of my way to make sure that I praise them for meeting that expectation and tell them, hey, thank you for that. I'm proud of you. Uh, because when I notice at, at home with my daughter, every little thing she does um, from, um, uh, would you like some more? Can you say more? More. Okay. Can you say please? Please. All right. Here you go. Say thank you. Thank you. Right. And so I'm training her. One, well, I, I want her to be a decent human being. So I'm doing my best to let her know the norms of society. Uh, but two, just being continuous, being structured, because structure and inconsistency equals safety. I want my daughter to know she's safe at the home, just like with the students. I want to be consistent and I want to be fair. And I want them to know that um, what the norms at home may be different uh -huh. than here at school. Right. And then, you know, aspects of some parents may have blended family or, you know, they go to they go to dad Monday through Thursday and mom on the weekends. Right. You know, like there's so many different aspects of engagement. Yes. And what if they're, you know, step parents that may have a different style than dad or what you, there's a lot of variables that come into looking at engaging, engaging children and so forth. But for me, I just try to put myself in a position, one, to turn work off, to give my daughter. Um, an appropriate time uh, to where I feel like I'm filling her cup uh, as well, just as much as I do uh, with the kids, even at school, turning off the, the paperwork or the work. We always say people over paperwork in finding a way to engage them in balance. I don't, I don't want them to just, just see me as a disciplinary. I call it hitting the streets. I get in the hallway. If I don't get into every class or at least half the classes every day, I feel out of touch with my campus. And so it's really important for them just to see me. Praise them, correct them, right? But also find ways to engage them to where they know they can come to me uh, for anything uh, and help them make better decisions as we navigate this gap of social interaction that they're suffering from. Well, thank you, Joe. I know you have to dip out, but I think that that mm -hmm. was what I continue to hear um, is just the relationship itself. Bailey had said it too. Um, and then sh I keep hearing structure because it, it sounds like I'm like, I don't know if you're hearing this, parents. We still want our kids to be safe. We want some sort of structure. Um, may not always know what it looks like, but I'm interested now to hear um, from you, Liz, like about your parenting style because, you know, like Joe, single parent dad, right? Um, and blended families, right? Let's, you know, hear from Ms. Hall. She's married, you know? So I'm like really interested to know from you, um, you know, what's your take on where you sit with your parenting styles and maybe Mr. Hall as well. Sure. Um, I definitely am the parenting style of, you know, that middle ground. Like, I I am a very structured person. I like a schedule. My kids go to bed at the same time during the weekday. Um, I feel like, you know, boundaries, they keep us safe, right? And I feel like 
kids know what to expect when they, when you have those boundaries and in turn they feel safe um i read something the other day that i loved and it was it's an analogy with um, boundaries and it said something like um boundaries are like bumpers at a bowling alley um they set you up for success and they keep you from rolling in the gutter and they offer a gentle but from correction to get the ball headed in the right direction and ultimately ensure you hit at least a few pins at the end of the lane. And I love that because it's so true. Like, and I think it's so true to have those, like the consistency of the boundary. And sometimes it's so hard to keep the consistency of those because I find myself so often saying, okay, if you do that one more uh -huh, time, uh -huh. this is going to happen. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to stick to my word. <laughs> the it, follow through. It's, so, it's so hard because it's so easy to kind of veer off and, you know, not keep your word of, you know, when you're going to discipline. Um, but I love how you said that because I think sometimes parents don't want to to say that or they may feel insufficient like, oh, I messed up. I should have. Right. Yeah. But I think also. And I don't you know if you agree to Bailey, I think us as educators, we get like that, too. Believe it or not, parents, we do some of the similar things, <laughs> you know, here at school. And so that's why it's so important that you hear. And I love having um, our, you know, district i like to call them experts in their own way um outstanding professionals really attested like hey we're all human we're all in this together we're every single you know day just trying our best to live life and live it right and you know to teach our kids and empower our kids and lead um the best that we, we can um and we have platforms such as this just to to bring light and suggestions and to and to take that um so i thank you um, Miss Hall for just, you know, being vulnerable to say like, oh, gosh, like, yeah, I should have because I know I'll get like that. You do that one more time, you know, and I would hear my parents, you do that one more time. This is going to happen. And then, you know, sometimes our kids are like, yeah, it didn't happen. Nice try. Right. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I had a um, experience not too long ago with with um, my seven year old Ruby and she has one of our old iPhones that you can connect to Wi-Fi and play games on. And so many times I say, listen, like, I'm going to take that phone away if, if you continue to do that, you know. And she looked me in the eye and she goes, Mom, you're too nice. You're not going to do that. And I'm like, oh, boy, I really need to check myself because I'm giving these, you know, empty promises of what I'm going to do to discipline and... And I'm not following through, you know, so it's, it's definitely, there's so many difficult aspects of, of parenting. And I think I told you in an email, like I fail all the time, you know, and I think it's just picking back up and trying again and just being consistent. And I also think as parents, like, um, being able to apologize, you know, uh -huh. when you didn't do it the way you thought you should, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that lets them know, like, we're not perfect. These, even as, you know, little children, even as parents, like none of us are perfect. And I think letting them know, you know, that we too have to apologize when we don't get it right. So. Absolutely. Ashley, can I add on to that? Real yes. Quick? Yes. Um, whenever you read that quote, I was thinking about my favorite quote about boundaries, because I personally have been doing a lot of work myself for boundaries. Um, but and this is why I have this quote, but Brene Brown's one of my favorite ladies out there, Texas lady. And one of her quotes about boundaries is that it's, um, it says, it's on my computer screen, what boundaries do I need to establish for me to be in my integrity and generous towards you? Oh, and I think that's huge as a parent because our number one job is to be generous, right? We're giving all the time. Um, but with, we can only do that if we're clear and going back to that self-awareness and understanding. But what are our boundaries, Absolutely. you know, um, and our limits too. And another thing I was thinking about you saying that you fail all the time. That's usually one of the things I say is, well, I had my mom fail with the week. <laughs> 
because it happens, but you know, too, I think it's interesting because I always give myself grace. And when I tell myself that, you know, it's interesting to think of myself as a parent and as this big, you know, this, this mom with her big girl panties on this grown up because it, our kids are really, whenever we have kids, usually we're pretty young, you know, younger. And it's interesting that we're raising them while they're watching us grow up. Uh-huh, uh-huh. what's really happening uh-huh. and it's just really profound to to think about that because what we would hope that they would take from that at least me is just what you said apologizing when you make a mistake call it what it is and let them know i'm doing this for my first time this is the first time for me to raise kids they're going to be my only time it's just you too and so i'm going to make mistakes and i hope that you help me grow from those mistakes because i'm growing too and so I think that that's really profound of you to say that apologizing is important because, you know, they're always watching us. And what we would hope they would learn, I would hope that they learn from what I'm showing them every day, not just whatever I'm telling them. So beautiful beautifully stated miss hall so that goes perfect into bailey as we start to get wrap up towards the end of our show let's get into the gushy stuff so i'm i'm hearing you know safe and structured and just kind of being in that in between authoritative just giving knowing how to give and take um but you know keeping that relationship we do um something called stoic um, here um, in in the school setting, and I know that um, our last co-host Denise Griffin really talked about like even possibly what that could look like at home because sometimes the structures of our you know of our home setting or the things that we do um, we may not even be aware of right because we have life happening Bailey we have yeah. life happening <laughs> every day but um, I think it's the power of reflection that you leave this show today with some tools to say like let me reflect on just my household like just physically emotionally just w- what what's happening within my family here and how can I you know set some things as far as setting boundaries um, limits even example consequences right because I'll emphasize again like we're not saying like all of these things are gonna work you know um, it's gonna win you a million dollars or something like that and you're gonna be super mom for the entire galaxy we're not saying that but I but I, I do feel that if we just take some time to just you know stop and I know you're like I don't have time for that but just look at what's happening with our kids what's happening within our household and how can we get some systems or even example things in place like we do for teachers? And I just, it came off of me. I'm like, oh, what if we like did like stoic a little bit like at home? Like even for me too, because I'm a mama. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do this all the time because I live and breathe stoic. And so just to review what stoic is. Yes. So it's an acronym about the variables, the only variables actually that in the classroom, but it is transferable to all aspects of life, that um, we can manipulate these variables to shape and change behavior. And so S is for structure, T is for teach, O is for observe, I interact, and then C correct. So if any of those, those can be manipulated to kind of Play the cards in your favor, I guess mm-hmm. you say, mm-hmm. or to shape behavior and, and to teach what it is that we need to happen, but ensure it's success along the way. And I think at home, I, I think of two examples. So I, as a parent, listen to myself when I'm the naggiest. And so that for me is usually whenever I feel rushed in any way, or I feel like, you know, I, I like that high level of structure. So when my kids have a lot of room to make a mistake. That's usually when I want to be on top of everything. Um, and so I have to stoic. I have to put stoic in place, one, to keep myself in check and to allow my kids to learn what I need them to learn, right? Um, and so, you know, what I think about, Joe had said earlier, house rules. Mm-hmm. Um, I think house rules, we say that at school, like we have our school rules, yes. and those are absolutely applicable within that environment. But in life, there's lots of different environments that we have to be a part of. We have mm-hmm. the airport, we have the restaurant, we have, you know, and then we have our house. And so we do things differently depending on the environment we're in, but so it can be applied in any of those. So, you know, whatever I teach my kids at home or in the school, I try to relate back to life because it's that purpose and intentionality and why are we doing this anyway. 
Um, but in the mornings when I'm the nattiest, I, I heard myself and I was like, I'm miserable getting ready for work. And so they must be even more miserable because I'm the one who's making it miserable for everybody. And so what we did is I sat them down at a neutral time and I said, okay, guys, I've noticed that I, I'm pretty loud in the morning and it's not working for me because my whole day feels bad after that. I want to leave you with a smile on your face and you smiling too. So let's work together and figure out how to do that. I said, so you're getting old enough and you need to know how to get yourself ready. I can't do it for you anymore because I have a lot of hair to do. So what I'm going to do is we're going to make a checklist for each of you of what it is that you need to do in the morning. So that was the structure part. I'm going to put a system in place for them to be able to follow that, right? Um, so we sat down and they weren't at the age yet where they could read and write proficiently. So they just drew little pictures and they did their own sketch. I couldn't tell what the picture was, but they knew exactly what it was. Feed the dog was the cutest thing. It was supposed to be a dog, I guess, with a dog bowl next to it. <laughs> but they each have their own little list of all the things they do, and I let them kind of come up with it. Like, what do you do first? What do you do next? And then I asked the hard question of, do you think that's the most important thing to put on your list? Because they were putting things on it should have been on the list. In any case, they made their list, and then we practiced it. So that's the teach part. So I said, okay, let's pretend like it's the morning. And we went through, and... I was putting the pressure on them and pretending to be, you know, like the crazy mom in the morning. And my daughter looked at me and she said, Mom, I got this. I have my checklist. And I said, okay, well, it looks like this might work. And so that was the transition of going back to school after COVID. That's whenever I was the nattiest. Um, and now I can gladly say that in the mornings, all I do is interact positively. And there's no correction needed because it's smooth sailing. So... The last thing I have to ask is when we're headed out the door, I say, hey, did we sign your folder? Because that's another expectation in my house. I'm a bad folder mom, I have to admit. I, I'm the worst at signing the folders. But um, that's one example of stoic. Another one um, would be, you know, simple things like, okay, my kids love to throw their laundry all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so I'm buying a, I haven't done it yet. My plan is, is to buy them a laundry basket and to put it in the room. I know it seems simple, right? But it's not just putting the laundry basket in the room. It's going to be, we have to practice putting our laundry in the laundry basket. I have to be present enough to give proximity and notice that they're actually doing it, observing. Then I have to be able to interact positively when they get it done, mm -hmm. right? And give them positive feedback when it happens so they see it's valuable. And then when the sock doesn't end up in the laundry, I'm going to have them actively put the sock in the laundry with a little prompting. And that's their correction is follow through of this is important. And I'm not just going to get mad at you when it doesn't happen, but we're going to make sure it happens. And so corrections don't always have to be punishment. Uh -huh. It doesn't have to be, you know, the best at school, at least in, in my experience at home too, is the best correction is practice because that shows that there's a reason that it's important in the first place. And it's not that you made a mistake. It's that we need to make sure that this happens because it's important. So let's do it together. So then I know you're more capable to do it on your own. I love how there's so many, and I want to hear from you, Liz, um, on just your insight to what she's saying with the stoic, because I love just the structure in that, like going through what is it the expectation that you are wanting and mm -hmm. then us as parents and I'm going to speak for myself as a mom on how do I approach that take the time to have it's kind of like what we do with teachers that plan discussion this is what I need you to do I'm going to help you to model with what I need you to do I'm going to watch you do it it's like you know we're coaching you know <laughs> with our kids and I think that that's the power of a relationship because you are still the parent, but what I hear from you is like, I'm going to watch you do it. And then I'm going to praise you when you're doing it right. Um, Cause I want you to do it more often. And if you do mess up instead of just like, Oh, that's it. You're grounded. I didn't told you 50 times, you know, like to do it and you keep getting it wrong. You're actually talking it through because I think that sometimes, and I'll be honest that that may uh, and I want Liz to um, chime in that may sometimes be the missing piece because we do get so irritated and I just want you to do what I need you to do. And I can't even only imagine when you have, you know, multiple kids, multiple different personalities, and then maybe, you know, 
you know, your husband or your significant other may be a little bit permissive or authoritarian and you're authoritative. I mean, it can be very, very overwhelming. But if you just take the time to, you know, stop, you know, gather, I like to say, gather your troops, gather your children <laughs> and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. And I love how you said that, Bailey, you, uh, which we're going to go in a little bit, but I want to hear from Liz about the, the I feel statements, because those are so powerful when you're connecting you know, with your kids to really talk about your frustrations and being vulnerable, but here's what we can do together. So um, let's say Ms. Hall just kind of chime in. Um, what are your thoughts about how she um, spoke about stoic? I love that. that. <laughs> I want to, I need to write that down. So remember <laughs> all of the, um, the acronyms because I love all those. Um, something that I've trying so hard to learn not only for myself uh -huh. but also to teach my kids is to you know like the kids are fighting something bugs them somebody hits this person somebody pulls this person's hair and so before we get to that point of like this fight's happening i am trying to teach them and even myself to pause uh -huh. to pause before you react because I feel like so many times that's half the battle. Like you react to something that's made you unhappy, you know, somebody took this toy away from me. And I think um, just taking a brief pause and being mindful of what you're going to do next. And it's so much, so easy to say, because as an adult, it's, I try to do it often and I fail over and over again, but I think trying to pause in that heated moment of frustration um, is, is so important and can, it teaches so much, you know, so. Um, That's yeah. an emotional aspect in it where you say pause, because sometimes our kids don't know how to do that because they're still learning about their character. And I know that as a school counselor, like it's very hard, like, but I'm so like, I'm so mad. And I say, you have every right to be mad. Absolutely. You have every right to be mad, but it is really, really important that we just don't have these negative defenses that allows to even bigger consequence. I always like to say, keep your problem small. Let's just keep it small. If something yeah. is wrong, and that's validated, but let's keep it small and work with it. You know, and that may be, you know, taking a deep breath or that may um, be just kind of, you know, pulling back or going to the room to just kind of let me get my mind right. And I know sometimes you parents would be like, well, what if that happens in the store where you just don't have a lot of that move around time? Okay. It always just takes, I'll say, the smallest amount of seconds. To just breathe. Let that oxygen just. Yeah. And if you have to take another one. You know. Because I think that that's a lot better. Than what you just um, stated Miss Hall. About how we do react. And just go off. Just like that. And then everything just becomes a domino effect. Um, so last thing before we move into. Because I know we're running out of time. Um, I loved how, you know, Bailey talked about, like, you know, the structure of stoic and giving those examples. And so would you say, Bailey, that like when you're, you know, setting your boundaries, can you um, tell us in your personal, you know, opinion and definition of what um, a boundary is, what a limit is and what a consequence? Because I think it can look very, very different. Like we have our boundaries here at school. We have our limits here at school. But I think sometimes our parents may not know what, what those words um, really mean. And they're not just bad. It's just the way that we structure within the settings that we are. Just like there's boundaries when we go to the mall. We can't just go woohoo crazy and just take everything that we want. Um, but there are things that just have to be in place. But I want to make sure like our parents understand like those words. And then last but not least, if you could just for two minutes um, with all of it, um, talk about, you know, just those consequences um, and really just thinking about like if if and when my child does this maybe in a negative way and I want to give some type of consequence um, 
I would rather say when we're looking at those consequences, just to make sure that is this something that when the kid, our, our kid, our child is getting this consequence, is it going to help to grow them? Is it going to help them to understand that this is not what, what we want to see and help to replace the behavior in a positive light? Because I think sometimes we just go to the punitive. You know, and just you're grounded, Te technology, and those things are necessary at some times. But when we really think about consequences, um, the end goal, I feel that we should all as parents as well as professionals be, we want you to grow from this. We don't want you to repeat the behavior. So how are we going to make ensure that that happens? Yeah. So whenever I think of limits, I think of what is my limit? So, oh, you know, okay. like pet peeves and mm -hmm. things like that. So I think that's where that self-awareness for the adult in the situation comes in because we all have limits mm -hmm. like we that we could surpass. You know, yes. like I, if you cross this limit, <laughs> then I, I'm i going to react instead of respond. And I think it's healthy for the people who are living in your household mm -hmm. or for the people that you're working with mm -hmm. or for the students who are in your classroom to understand that everybody has a limit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at home, think of what are the ways that you can communicate that with each other. Um, me personally, I let my kids know whenever I feel so, I, I, I can tell like it's one of those days and awesome. my, awesome. my patience is thin. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I do is I give them a free correction because it's like, we all are short tempered some days and I want to model for them what do you do on the days when you're feeling like that? I have a very emotional six-year-old daughter. <laughs> like, see, she's just like me. So it's like, I better give her some tools real quick. Um, and so, you know, I'll just tell them, hey guys, I just need you to know, I can already tell I'm feeling really short-tempered today. So here are the things that I would prefer you not do today. Oh, I love it, baby. I love it. I love it. I don't think I, I, don't think I could take it. <laughs> and they know right off the bat, you know, that, that, for mom's sake, let's just not go there. Um, and luckily, I do have pretty compassionate kids. Uh, I like to think that it's because I, we've instilled that in them, but they usually won't cross the limit if you tell them what the limit is, right? Um, for me, a boundary is creating a, an operational structure within an environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, like you said, you're not going to go to the grocery store and run down all of the aisles. Yep. Boundaries are basically operational guidelines or rules that we put in place um, for the safety of everybody. Like Joe was saying, safety is number one and safety is non-negotiable. No matter what environment you go into, safety is non-negotiable. So if it, you know, is unsafe, then that is out of bounds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting at school, whenever you have four-year-olds in pre-K, the youngest to the oldest kids, if you tell them hey, this, we can't do this because it's unsafe. 99% of the time, they will not do that because they understand the importance of safety. Because they want to feel safe and they want their friends to feel safe. So safety is always number one and, and that is an, an easy way to kind of address things. But then when it comes to like corrections and consequences, yes. you were talking, Ms. Hall, about responding to things and not being so quick to react by taking the breath. And so as the adult in every situation, that's what I ask people to do. I say, you know, we have to respond. And if we just react to things, nothing good happens on the fly. We have to have an intentional approach to things if we want good things to come of it. There's good that can come from every situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when thinking of consequences, here's some tips. These are, these are the actual names for some corrections that we use in school and that are completely applicable to home. So the first thing would be, I've talked a lot about a pre-correction. That's just being upfront and open and honest about what you expect to see before it occurs. So guys, I've noticed that, you know, we just went on a camping trip this weekend to the lake and you have a lot of dirty clothes in your back. So when we walk in the door, your first job is gonna be going into the laundry room and putting your clothes in your hamper. Because you know, if they end up on the floor, that's going to result in you know, time later that you're gonna waste. Just mm -hmm. so you know, make sure you get your laundry in the basket, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, another one that you could use is proximity. That's that observing um, people, you people, right? It's like what cops do. We know when they're on the corner Thursday morning and we're gonna go the speed limit because we know he's there, right? And so just being present for your kids, not because you expect for them to make a mistake, 
but them just knowing that you're present and attentive really does impact their behavior. They want to be responsible. They want to, they, you know, they're eager to please. Um, they want to do the right thing. And if they know that we're watching, but they also know we're going to follow that up with feedback, proximity is powerful. Um, another one is just providing positive feedback to their attempts of something. Uh -huh. So when they make a mistake, you say, you know, I noticed that you tried to put those clothes in the hamper. They landed next to it. I mean, you got a little closer this time. Ah. Now let's put them in the hamper. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and so you can use a little humor now and then too, but you're still correcting them. It's a correction, but you're, you're showing them that you're paying attention to what they're trying to do. They're getting closer. Um, another one, we call it a hit and run, and it's not what it sounds like. It is just a quick correction that you use, but then you go away and give them space to fix it. This one's really powerful at home, especially with the kids arguing and fighting uh, in the bedroom. You know, they're, whenever they're playing in there, you can hear it getting a little heated. Walk in there and say, I notice it sounds like you're having a conflict right now. Um, figure out how to solve the problem. If you need my help, I'll be back in two minutes. Let's see if you can do that. Nine times out of ten, when I come back, they fix the problem or they've already come to me for help. So it's just giving them the correction real quick and then giving them time and the space to see what they're going to do to fix it on their own. Um, and the last one I would talk about is, well, there's two more, but you already talked about it, Ashley. It was discussion at a neutral time. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have time, it's best when kids are learning things, whether, what, whatever they're learning. If you're talking about it in the heat of the moment, it's going to be a heated moment. But if you find time, kind of like me creating the checklist for them, out of the time of the morning, it's a neutral time. It's easier to talk about. And what you have to say is going to fall listening ears, not deaf ears. Um, the last one would be restitution. Mm -hmm. And that's just fixing what's broken, working to make something right. You know, you, you can use this with things, toys that they break or relationships that they may fracture. So in any of those cases, what can we do to make this? Right. And then that's teaching them that I'm going to, like you said, I'm going to help you through this, but your consequence and your correction right now is that something's broken because of what you've done or the choice that you made and you have to fix it. We can't leave things broken. Wow. Those are just some tips on different corrections. That was awesome. <laughs> like, wow, Bailey. No, that was awesome. I'm glad that you broke it down. And like she said before, um, you know, and I know like I just for short, you know, Bailey does a really, really great job helping us to, you know, understand even just our delivery with our students here um, in her role. Um, and she's so positive. If you, if you notice, like all of the things that she said, I started off seeing consequences and I learned so much from Bailey. Um, I, I listened to intent, intentionally to her delivery when she's, you know, speaking of corrections. I like that. You know, because it puts a positive spin on, hey, we're trying to build character. We want to see the correct thing. And so here are some things and tips and tools that you can use to make sure that we're getting the expectation of the behavior we want to see. So kudos to Bailey because she can <laughs> she nails it every single time um, before we leave. Um, and we kind of already hit it on it before we just get into the questions um, that some parents will share and we can all chip in and, and, and ask before we close out. Um, when we are in angry moments and alterations, uh, altercations, I know one of the things that um, I help my teachers to understand and help my parents to understand too is the use of counseling skills. Sometimes people think, oh, well, I'm not a counselor, so I can't use counseling skills, but we actually, when we're, you know, using or implementing effective communication, everyone, I feel like, is a counselor at heart because we are, it's, it's the way that we show our affection towards each other and respecting each other and valuing each other. And one of the things, parents, if I can empower you um, to do anything is that when you're having conversations with your kids, listen. You know, you want to make sure that the message, no matter what it is, is I hear you, I see you. I may not always agree, but I hear you, I love you, I value you. And nine times out of ten, you know, when I, you know, talk to our students here one on one, um, they, you know, always state that that's, you know, some of the things that they need. 
that they want to hear. Like, I, I do value you. I do love you. I know that this is rough. Um, and I think it would be a powerful thing to use when you're at home along with using stoic, along with using all of these corrections, when you're having that intimate time and really having that conversation to go back and forth of, I see that you're frustrated. I know that you, you know, are angry. Um, so with I statements, and Bailey used a lot of them, um, when she was giving kind of her scenarios with her kids, and I kind of heard it a little bit from Miss Hall, is to be vulnerable, you know, with your children to say, I feel upset when you, you know, to really say that this, so that they can understand it's not just a blaming, well, you did this and you did that and a lot of you, 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 but saying, hey, you know, I feel whatever the way that you feel or I feel annoyed or I feel irritated or, you know, I feel very frustrated or I feel confused um, when I'm wondering why you didn't bring your homework and you leave it every single type of week. Help me to understand what's happening so mama can be the best mom for you and helping you um, to make sure that you're not forgetting things because it's power um, when you're having those conversations like that and you're using statements um, that clearly tell you know your children or your child I see you I hear you allow me to help you and I honestly feel like even our oldest older kids like in junior high if you have some in high school or even adults They'll be able to receive what you are saying more when they feel that they are valued and respected um, and that, yes, you have high expectations. But first and foremost, I love you. And here is what I need from you as, you know, your mom, dad or your caregiver or whomever you are. So with some closing questions I did allow. Thank you so much, Bailey, um, for giving us that stoic and and really defining what limits, consequences, and boundaries are. There was a couple of questions from some parents, and we only have probably about three minutes. So one of the questions anonymously would be, um, what advice would you give when my child has to go between different households with different expectations? And either of y'all can give some insight or... Yeah, well, as a, a child who went back and forth between houses, what I yearned for was clarity and understanding what's expected from me at home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So understandably, the houses are going to have their own house rules. And the parents may or may not have clear communication, and that's not up to the, the kid and everybody's <clears throat> in their own situation, right. respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at the end of the day, it would be um, clarity and being able to talk to the child when they are at your house, just like you said, using the I feel statements to be able to communicate why this is important mm -hmm. and that it's okay that our house operates differently mm -hmm. than dad's house or mom's house because you're going to have to figure out how to work within many different environments your whole life. So, you know what? You're getting a heads up. <laughs> and I love heads up on everybody else because you are flexible. <laughs> and I love how you, you said that. And I love how you just said the statement, it's okay. It's okay because blended families, like, it's just different. Like, there's two different settings. And, you know, sometimes we may feel like, oh, but when my son or, you know, my daughter goes over to dad's house or mom's house, it's just kind of loosey-goosey. And I know that that's hard, right? Because who's affected in the middle? You know, the kid. But I, I, I honestly feel that, you know, when you still validate and say, I know that it's rough and I know that it's hard. And it's the same thing. And Bailey can say, you know, parents with teachers you know the higher they get you know some teachers are a little bit more flexible than others they're gonna have to understand and know how to work with different um personalities and different classroom structures you might have two teachers and one allows you to just get up and sharpen pencils get whatever you need and the other one may say hey you gotta raise your hand um and <laughs> that's just the world we live in miss hall you want to comment yeah, I think um, kind of like Bailey said, I love that she, you know, stated that it's okay that the other household isn't like ours. It doesn't make it bad, you know, it, one's not better than the other. But I think having that open line of communication and just, um, I know you've said it before, but validating them and helping them feel seen, I think is really important because that... Um, you gain trust with them and they'll want to, you know, 
come back and talk to you more, um, you know, when there is trouble. Absolutely. Our um, next question I, um, is, what advice would you give when your child does not like his or her teacher or refuses to listen to school authority? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I would, I mean, first of all, the, the first thing is, is to ask why. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it could very well be that they don't feel like they have connection at school. And, you know, usually that's the number one reason why we see misbehavior is because there's a lack of connectedness. And, you know, that's what I, I am excited to come to work every day for is because I help facilitate those connections. And it's hard sometimes. And, you know, sometimes we have to do a lot of work to figure out what that facilitation is going to look like. But at the end of the day, you know, there, there's a lot of human basic needs, but the ones that are the strongest, and serve as the most is the need for connection through, you know, acknowledgement, recognition, and love. And if we don't attain those in, in some way when we're going about our daily lives, then we're going to feel, you know, that the, we're not going to reap the benefits that we should be from that environment. And so if you have a kid who doesn't want to come to school, they probably aren't as connected as they could be. The one asked the kid, you know, why do you feel that way? Listen to them and really hear what they're saying and then help them work through how, depending on how old they are, how do you go about to make that better? You know, mm -hmm. my kids come home often, they're like most other kids and they, you know, will pretend sick and they won't want to go to school or my daughter will come home because she's a bit of a drama queen and she'll uh, tell me about all the horrible things that happened to her all day long. And then I don't hear an ounce of positivity. And so I'll really have to coach her and say, what I'm hearing you say is that you didn't have a good day because this bad thing happened and another bad thing. But what are the things you tried to do to make that better? Hmm. Did you do anything to try to make that better today? Or did you just want to have a bad day? Mm -hmm. And you know that she's getting to the age where she understands what I'm saying. And so now she'll come home and say, so there were some bad things that happened. But before I tell them to you, <laughs> it's like she wants to tell me. But first, she just needs me to bell. Yes, mom. I did something to make it better, or I did try to help someone today, you know, so. That's um, that, resi yeah, that's that resilient piece I love that I'm hearing from you, um, not to just run away from the problem, and I know some of y'all are wondering, well, you know, what if, you know, my kid is little and can't articulate, I think it's still powerful to ask what's going on, why do you feel this way, and then I would take it a step further, and it's just a suggestion, I know sometimes we don't, but have an in-person conference, reach out to the teacher, like, I want to work with you, you know, this is what, um, you know, such and such is, you know, saying, you know, um, maybe there's, you know, some misunderstandings. How can we work to, as a team? Because that's really, really important. And I know my admin were really big on that, um, is that kids still, no matter what, see that, you know, the school and my parents were united. We're one team and we want the best for them. Um, and so I think part of that is um, the parent to reach out, right? Instead of just reaction and just like, oh, I want my kid out of that room. My kid just doesn't like. Let's kind of get into the, the grit of understanding, well, what's going on? You know, what are some things going on? And then how can we move forward? So I think that's important. Um, well, we are really out of time. And so I will say that I think that this is, we could probably talk for hours, um, but this was an amazing just starting point for some of our families um, to really have them just thinking about, um, you know, their your families and structure. I know that it has helped me um, too as a mom because, I, like I said, I know sometimes when I get tired, I can get a little loosey-goosey, but I'm going to reel it in, Bailey. I'm going to reel it in. I promise I'm going to reel it in, uh, and I'm going to become better because that's why we're all together. So thank you, ladies, so much. Um, for having mm -hmm. us um, on and we'll see you again on the next Get Right With Miss Wright. Mm -hmm.